Hey guys, what's up? I'm Noah, this is Analog Resurgence, and today we're talking about Kodak and the moon landing. This year, 2019, is the 50th anniversary of the first manned mission to the moon. Now, of course, that achievement and all the work that led up to it is a massive amount of combination from all sorts of different technology and hard work over years and years. And Kodak actually played a pretty big part in all of that because, well, they were the big company back then in terms of capturing moments on film. From really early test launches where they would set up a ton of different cameras and photograph a bunch of different images all at once, all the way up to the actual moon landing where NASA astronauts took Hasselblad cameras to the moon that used Kodak Ektachrome film in side of them, along with 16 millimeter motion picture cameras as well. But if we go back to the earlier phases of the actual moon landing, Kodak played a really integral role in helping NASA to figure out exactly how and where this whole moon landing thing was going to go down. You see, in the 1960s, there was still a lot about the moon that people just didn't know. And so in order for NASA to figure out exactly how and where to land people safely on it for this manned mission, they needed to know as much about the actual surface of the moon moon as possible. This meant being able to take detailed enough photos of the surface of the moon in order to use as reference for mapping different regions, and ultimately figuring out exactly where to land the Apollo capsule. Now today you can send a rover to Mars and have it transmit back detailed information, but in the 1960s you couldn't just strap a digital camera to a satellite, send it shooting off to the moon, and then have it send those pictures back to NASA here on Earth. This is because back then they were using film, and for film, it's a little more difficult. So NASA needed to have an unmanned satellite that they could outfit with a high resolution camera system, send it unmanned to the moon, have it take different pictures of the moon's surface, have the film be developed in a completely automated system, and then scan and send those images back to NASA here on Earth. And that's where Kodak came in. So around 1963, in the early phases of the project, Kodak put together plans in order to install a camera in an unmanned satellite. And this became known as the Lunar Orbiter Program. This camera system had two lenses, one very high resolution lens and one medium resolution lens, and this allowed the satellites to take a variety of images of the lunar surface. It also took 70 millimeter film instead of 35 millimeter, which allowed for much, much more detailed images to be captured. One of the biggest hurdles of this entire process though was the development process of the actual film in the unmanned satellite's camera system. See, in a normal developing process for film, here on Earth at least, we use wet chemicals, and in order to develop the film, the film is submerged completely in these chemicals. But you don't necessarily want these tanks full of liquid chemicals in your unmanned satellite that's going to the moon. So Kodak put into place a system that they had previously developed for reconnaissance aircraft and this was called the BIMAT system. The BIMAT system is a dry processing system for film development, which meant that Kodak didn't have to install big tanks of chemicals or a complicated processor or anything like that in their unmanned satellite system. So in the BIMAT system, you have two main components, the film that you have shot and the BIMAT transfer film. The BIMAT film is a film that has been sort of laminated with chemicals. It's not completely wet, but it has these active chemicals on it. As the film in the satellite is shot, it is then advanced, and the exposed film and the BIMAT film come into contact with each other. As the BIMAT film is pressed against the exposed film, the film is developed via the chemicals on the BIMAT. The final piece of the whole puzzle, though, was exactly how to get the images that were on this developed film because of the BIMAT system back to Earth using the camera system inside of the unmanned satellite. So after the BIMAT development process is completed, the developed film actually moves over to a scanning unit inside of the camera system in the satellite. Now, as a pretty basic explanation as to how this works, the scanning unit was essentially a really, really bright light and the film would move across this bright light, and the intensity of the light would change depending on the density of the image on the film. So denser parts of the film would have less light that could shine through it, but thinner parts of the film would have more light that could shine through it. So these changes in light density were converted into different values. And all of that information, along with the location, the telemetry of the actual satellite, and where the images were taken on the surface of the moon, was all sent via a signal back to NASA on Earth. 
burn. And all of that density exposure information from the scanning unit inside the camera of the satellite was then reassembled on NASA's end and printed back onto 35 millimeter film. And the end result was an actual detailed image of the surface of the moon, taken entirely on an unmanned spacecraft very, very far away. And that was it. That's the process that Kodak helped invent in order to get NASA's camera to the moon, take those pictures, and send all that detailed information back to NASA. And you can see a ton of these photos online. Ultimately, the Lunar Orbiter program was a big, big success, and NASA launched five different orbiters between 1966 and 1967. Orbiter 1 launched August 1966, Orbiter 2 in November of 1966, Orbiter 3 in February of 1967, Orbiter 4 in May of 1967, and Orbiter 5 in August of 1967. So because of these orbiters, more than 3,000 detailed images of the moon's surface were photographed. And ultimately, 99% of the moon's surface was successfully mapped because of this program. Now, if we actually look at some of the original photos that were released by NASA around that time, you can see these early ones have a bunch of different lines through them. And that's just a result of how the scanning system worked and broke up the information and how it was all reassembled into one image later on. In 2007, though, these images underwent restoration by the Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project, which took all the original video data that was sent from the satellites and converted them to higher quality pictures. So now we can actually see these images much, much clearer and closer to how they actually looked from the satellite. But it's also interesting to note that the only reason that I can do a video like this and the reason that we know about the BIMAP process in general is that it was actually declassified by the American government back in the early 2000s. Before that though, it was classified information because of its involvement with reconnaissance missions and the moon landing project. And just because it was a really important, useful process that Kodak had created that the government got a lot of use out of. As for the five lunar orbiters themselves, well, these things weren't exactly made to last. And each one only had a lifespan of about a few months to a year at the very most. So when they started to degrade and NASA sent another one up to take its place, the old one was simply crashed into the surface of the moon. You know, if you actually think about it and put it all together, between the lunar orbiters that were crashed into the moon, the 16 millimeter cameras that they took with them up there, there is a ton of film gear waiting up there on the moon. Hey, thank you guys so much for watching and I hope that you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't done so already as I continue to cover different topics like this. And if you want to support the channel at all, there is a link in the description below to the Analog Resurgence Patreon. You get more information on some of the videos that I cover along with a bunch of different photos and samples for when I do the role review videos. And of course, if there's any sorts of topics or stuff that you want to hear more about or see me talk about in the future, then comment down below on this video and just all the videos. And thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys soon.